She left her high-paying marketing career in the corporate world to tell the truth, advising international doctors and whistleblowers and exposing what the public wasn't allowed to see about COVID through her work on the Twitter files. Lindsay Jones is her name, but she is better known as Texas Lindsay. Thank you so much for being my guest, Lindsay, and really for being one of the brave ones to risk it all to, to do what you do. How are you? Hey, Liz, thank you so much for having me on. I, I'm great, and I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak with you after seeing your own bravery that you faced for um, that was featured in a Candace Owens documentary. So um, I, I commend you, and I, I think that more bravery is needed during um, you know, stressful times. Well, speaking of stressful times, no, I appreciate the, those kind words. We had an instant connection uh, right away. But but talk about that. How did you even get here? You uh, do live in Texas, uh, as you are uh, Texas Lindsay, of course. But but what did life look for like for you in, in 2020? And what made you go ahead and take this giant leap? It's a number of things. Uh, whenever I first heard about the vaccine, I was a little bit skeptical. And I thought, you know, how could they rush something and make it um, safe and effective so quickly? I think a lot of people, anybody um, that was looking at this initially in 2020 kind of had the same skepticism because the, the propaganda wasn't full on yet. Um, but someone sent me a video that was really powerful. And then I found out it was censored and removed from YouTube. And it was a doctor who was both a doctor and a lawyer sharing this information about the animal trials. And she analyzed and went through why they never made it to human trials with this type of technology and, um, and just outlined everything. She said, everything I'm sharing with this, uh, with, with you now is available online. Anybody can go research it, fact check it. And I, I did, I went and looked into it and I thought, well, this is very concerning. Why did they censor this video? Whenever, anytime censorship has occurred in history, there's always, um, a reason for it and it's never a good one. So um, I, I thought that was that was odd. And so I started, you know, trying to find information somewhere, but big tech had a, a already had a, a death grip on a lot of the information um, and getting access to that. But then I found um, a Substack article that was shared with me by uh, Dr. Jessica Rose. And that one was the most alarming um, Substack article that I had read and that was an early 2021. So the first thing I did was share it on Facebook. And normally when I would post anything on Facebook, it would take off and there would be comments. And this was in, um, let's see, J January, 2021. And it didn't, it didn't go anywhere. And there were no comments like, no, like, it's like, I just shared something and nobody saw it. And I was like, this is eerie. I didn't, I didn't write the word COVID. I didn't write the word vaccine. I just said, this is important. I think people should read this and nobody saw it. So I immediately realized that there was an AI algorithm going on that was blocking links um, shared to outside sources. And this was really before anybody was talking about the number, the amount of censorship. There wasn't, I don't think there was too many labels at this point. There might've been for like masks and things, but, um, so I thought I need to find an alternative to get this information out because this is so important. People need to know. So at the time, though, you're working a very good job in, in corporate America. You are a marketer and kind of your job to sort of market a message. And you did. You basically left your, your career to be able to, to help people like this, as you're saying, to, to, get these, to get these messages out. Basically, when you come across something like that, that's so um, alarming, and you can't figure out a way to share it. Um, my, you know, growing up, I always thought if I was alive during the Holocaust, because that was the most, you know, tragic, horrific thing that you could, that we, I have to compare this to. Um, what would I do if I was alive during that time? Every, you know, watching every documentary, I thought this is horrible. What could I have done if I was alive? What would I have done? And I was faced with, what I saw is a very dire time where people needed help and people needed information. And the CDC and the FDA and all of these big corporations were pushing out propaganda and marketing these drugs to people without disclosing any of the risks or, or make, and they're just making it very easy to understand, safe and effective over and over. It's branding and messaging and it was brilliant. And what I didn't see was the counter narrative. So I thought, 
we need more people offering a counter narrative so we can show that they're, these are not what they're saying, but we needed to combat the message in a simple way um, with information that was important, but also um, countered what was being pushed because not, there's never been a drug in history that is 100% safe and 100% effective, but that's essentially what they were saying for years. <laughs> so I, I wanted to take my skills, my knowledge with branding and marketing and PR and implement those. And so I did that and, and juggled that with my full-time job. And then um, late last year, I decided it was more important to, to do this work and to continue to push um, important messages to the public than um, it was for me to try to aspire um, to a career that where I'm just focusing on, um, you know, get, making more money and climbing the corporate ladder that no longer um, I, I had, had goals I was making all throughout my career. I was very um, happy with it, um, but I, I no longer could be happy or satisfied knowing what was happening um, to people that weren't able to understand or access important information. So you walk away from this six-figure income, and you've then been able to take Twitter and Substack, uh, just to name a couple of platforms, <laughs> by storm, I'd say, through your videos, writing, uh, the information that you're providing. But but talk about early on um, who you were helping, names that many of us now recognize in this freedom movement, uh, people who did come forward and, and sound the alarm about, about the injection. Well, the first thing I did whenever I realized that um, Facebook and Instagram were using AI to censor, um, I got on Twitter because I had just seen an interview a couple weeks before of Elon Musk um, interviewing with the Babylon Bee, and he was talking about how it's the only platform in the world that can really influence, you know, the town square and how you can connect with any politician, celebrity around the world. And I had never used my Twitter account. It sat there, and I never used it. And so I, I decided I would get on there and try to... Um, you know, get the messages that I couldn't get out anywhere else and share important research uh, on that platform. And within uh, the first week I was on there, Dr. Andrew Huff, who's the Eco Health Alliance whistleblower, he was tweeting about the information he had that could prove that it was a lab leak for COVID. And I read all his documents. I was able to verify that he was not just some random person that was making up things and he was trying well, to and actually i will say i will say Lindsay, that he's a, a minnesota native we've uh, interviewed him, him him before too yes so yeah. all, all roads lead back lead back here uh to minnesota but but great so you so you're going and going ahead and digging through his uh, information so he calls me he's like i just really need help with pr i can't get my story out and um in addition to connecting him with um project veritas and james o'keefe where he was at the time, he's now with a different, you know, media outlet that he started, but um, he had, you know, Project Veritas had two guys go out there and meet with them, but he had already released too much information. So they didn't, they like to be the ones that break the story. But um, I did help him connect with uh, media outlets all over the world. What we He interviewed with um, people from Bulgaria, um, the UK, Australia, Spain. I mean, everyone in the world wanted to talk to him, but the media here was pretty silent and it was really, I've never seen anything like it. He made like the, the alternate circuit that just wasn't mainstream news. I thought this would be a bipartisan, you know, slam dunk and everybody would want to talk to the, to a guy that worked at Eco Health Alliance. I could prove it was a lab leak. It was so naive. I had no, I had no idea. <laughs> We, we were naive here uh, as well. I think Alpha News was the only uh, Minnesota uh, media to, to profile his work, and, and you know the, the guy is from from here. But uh, Dr. Peter McCullough, I know, is also someone you you've helped along the way. Yeah, Dr. McCullough, it turns out my world got real small because he I found out he lived a mile and a half down the road from me. He reached out to me when I started making the epidemiological graphs, comparing the data around the world for how different countries what their results were for how they responded to COVID. A lot of times, I would show the vaccine rollout and whether that ended up lowering excess mortality or if excess mortality increased because that was a, a fascinating thing that Ed Dow pointed out. And then the U.S. data, who's a former BlackRock executive, was talking about the U.S. excess mortality data not being right. So I thought, well, if it's not right for the U.S., what other countries is it not right for? So I started going and looking at all of that data and ended up making over 50 um, videos. And I tried to keep them under one minute 
showing the data for the excess mortality and their different measures that they did um, a mass vaccination campaign and how that compared um, around the world. And they all had this, the same trend, depending on what they, they implemented. I did want to talk a little bit about your videos because they are very easy to digest and and really, I think, um, eye-popping when you when you get to the end, to, to, to the result. But talk about, um, in specifically, um, th this video will show as we're talking about it, what happened in Germany when booster shots uh, started being administered there. So Germany's excess mortality this year, in 2023, so we're three years into the pandemic, had the highest it's ever been since World War II, um, hit a 45% excess mortality rate. And that's not just for old people, it's for young people as well. But Germany was one of the countries, um, like many other Western Western countries rolled out, um, it was very, pushed the vaccine very, very hard and wanted to mandate it. I think they did mandate it in many places, but and they wanted to do a vaccine passport rollout. So there was a very um, hardcore agenda in place in Germany. And, but there was someone called, they refer to him as the, the German Fauci is, what his nickname is, uh, but he's come out and admitted that, you know, th they were wrong and that there are people that have died from the vaccine and been injured and it needs to be acknowledged. That has not happened here in the United States yet, unfortunately, but it is happening in other countries uh, where there's um, liability um, and people are going to court and being held accountable. So I'm, I'm happy to see that they're at least admitting it in Germany, that it's absolutely atrocious. They put up signs for all the people that have lost their lives um, as a result of these. They either they lost their lives or they're uh, permanently injured. It's it's horrific. You also, I know, helped to raise awareness through one of your videos um, on what you call the biggest whistleblower case in the world, and that is uh, another familiar name now, uh, Brooke Jackson. Now, Brooke is actually she doesn't live that far from me. That she lives about uh, 30, 45 minutes, depending on traffic. But I actually reached out to Brooke when I heard her case. It's like, what, can I attend your next court hearing? This was in um, early 2022. Um, I couldn't believe that I had not heard about her case. She, I mean, she came forward in 2020 is when she first came forward to blow the whistle, but they kept her case under seal for a year. And then she was done being quiet when she realized that they were just keeping her quiet. And she still has the potential um, to this day to... Um, be the only whistleblower case that I'm aware of that could actually um, cause Pfizer to be liable and undo the contract that's in place. Yeah, and I want to bring um, our viewers up to, to speed here, just fast forwarding a bit in, in your timeline, but Elon Musk, we know, uh, takes over Twitter, and then you're invited to Twitter headquarters, um, but, but talk about that. Explain your role in, in the Twitter files. This is a, an important part of history uh, that you've been able to witness. Um, so... I was actually suspended um, on Twitter in August. So all your videos, everything is gone. All of, so, all of your so they're not gone. gone. They, they, they actually were restored whenever um, I was reinstated. Not all of them because I had some um, alternate accounts I created whenever I was suspended. Uh, so all of the videos I posted on those alternate accounts are gone because they, sus they ended up suspending those as well. Um, but I got suspended for sharing a news clip of Tucker Carlson reading from The Lancet. That was what they suspended me for. I was shocked. I knew how to follow the rules. I knew sharing our world and data videos and overlaying that data was a little bit um, pushing the line, but I thought, well, they can't suspend me. This is, um, our world and data is funded by, by Bill Gates and they approve of him and <laughs> whatever he says. So I, I and nobody could dispute the data. That's why I went, that's why I used their data because I knew that that could not be disputed because it was their own. Um, their own as in the approved narrative. Um, but, so I was shocked. But um, fast forward to when Elon Musk bought Twitter, I uh, got my, my account reinstated either at the end of December or January. And um, I asked Brooke to introduce me um, to Paul around January or February. And she said that he was wanting to meet me too. Um, so she introduced us and uh, I heard a rumor about another journalist that was not gonna be the, the one covering COVID um, anymore uh, for the Twitter, as far as the Twitter files went and that there would be another journalist brought in. And I immediately thought, I, I have a feeling I know who this is. And I asked 
Paul said, is it you? Because he was sending me messages as well, asking me about this and that. He wasn't, he wasn't aware of uh, all the people, I think. He wasn't following it as closely as I was. Who was getting censored and what they were getting censored for. And as, if everybody from congressmen to um, people that graduated from Harvard and Yale and Stanford. It was just, it was in, in outrageous that, that these um, scientists and doctors and experts and politicians were getting censored for sharing accurate information. It was really troubling. Um, but I followed all of it, like, very closely. It was just, I could not believe everybody dropping around me for, for nothing. Um, sharing the, the, the data from CDC and FDA would get you suspended back then. So um, he invited me to come and help go through them, go through the files. And, um, and that's what I did. I made two trips out to San Francisco. The last trip I spent um, a week there. Even though I didn't have any income other than a couple hundred dollars from my sub stack um, since January. And that, that did cost a few thousand dollars to stay in San Francisco for a week and airfare and all that. But there, there's not an amount of money if I have it in my possession that I think would be a better investment than going and helping someone go through. Because if you don't know what to look for in the end, things to search for in this massive tro trove of information. I think there's, um, you know, so many missed opportunities for um, additional corruption that can be exposed. So, And we're going to show some of Paul Thacker's uh, threads here from Twitter, the Fauci files, uh, as they're called. And, uh, of course, his, his background obviously was great, I'm, I'm sure, to, to work with him. And there's a shout-out to you. Much thanks to Texas Lindsay, who helped collect and organize Twitter files. We read and read until our eyes bled. <laughs> so, so it sounds like, sounds like fun. But what was that like, um, you know, when you're seeing this uh, unfold before your eyes? Like, you know, you're, you're talking about, you knew it was happening, but to actually just see it all laid out there for you. They're just saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think a lot of these people that were doing the censoring, not all of them, but a lot of them were doing it because they had intentions that were good and they wanted to help save lives by preventing misinformation from being being shared. So getting to see exactly how they communicated, I think that that's what I thought all along um, and up until a certain point where it just got outrageous and I thought, there's no, there's no good intentions with this. This is blatant <laughs> censorship. Um, I think they just, they were mad that Elon was about to buy it and they just started um, shutting accounts down. Um, but it was it's fascinating to be in that world, being in the place that, that once told me that I, I'm not good enough to speak in the town square. Like that was, it's a horrible feeling being censored when you go on somewhere trying to fight um, against censorship and against um, freedom of speech. Because there were so many people that they either lost someone or they were injured themselves and they were censored and their accounts were shut down. And I can't think of anything more atrocious than denying somebody the ability to grieve publicly and to share what happens so that they, their story doesn't happen to someone else. Like that's what happened, and I watched it happen over and over and over again. And yeah, um, you find that the truth was censored to uh, to avoid vaccine hesitancy, yes. and I'm sure it just uh, in your mind uh, again um, helped to reinforce that that feeling you had all along. Exactly. I know you wrote on Substack, Lindsay, that uh, due to the censorship on social media platforms, medical experts from institutions such as Harvard, Stanford, MIT, and even the most published cardiologist in the world were silenced. As a result, many people were left in the dark about the potential risks of the COVID vaccines. The, the people behind the censorship industrial complex need to be held accountable for the irreparable harm that they have caused. Do you think that they ever will be Held, held accountable, and in your opinion, you know what? What should, what would that that look like to you? So, this is one thing that uh, I, I find frustrating, but I find myself in the same place sometimes. I feel like if we we give up um, the hope that these people will be held accountable, it ends up being some form of nihilism where we just don't expect justice or get, have hope in justice whatsoever. Which I think is a a feeling of despair that. No human needs. I think people people need justice so that they can heal and move on and so that we don't ever have this happen again. I think accountability is needed. 
I think these people need to publicly um, apologize. They need to admit openly. And then they need, I think hearings need to be had. They need to go to trial for um, the lives they affected if, for the people that were knowledgeable about what they were doing and whether or not they were lying. I think some people um, were willfully blind. Some people were very cognizant and aware of what was happening. And um, they need to be held accountable in a court of law. And I, some people will go as far to say that um, you know, they need Nuremberg trials for this. Uh, I wouldn't disagree, but I don't. I don't know how that happens without um, uh, the first the admission of guilt. That's where we need to start. Is people need to hold hold them accountable just in the uh, under oath for for lying to people. That's where we need to start, and then bring charges after that. As I stated at the beginning here, you really did risk it all jumping off this cliff as you're talking about these highly paid gigs. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that's interesting to pull back the curtain on uh, a lot of this, but you're volunteering basically to, to get the word out, uh, to, to spread the message. Some would say doing the job of an actual, you know, what our journalists uh, should should have been doing all along. But but share with, with um, you know, our viewers, our, our listeners here about where where you are now, um, in in many cases, you know, as I said, d doing this this work for free. But do you, you know, do you have any regrets at, at this point? I know you, you recently have been forced to move. You can't even afford the the place uh, where where you were staying anymore. Sorry, I don't want to cry about it. <laughs> I have no. Well, it's regrets. gotta be emotional. It's a whirlwind of a few years for sure. I have no regrets. Um, and there's still work that needs to be done. There's a, a dad that was just censored off of YouTube for sharing his own story about his son dying of myocarditis five days after he got a shot and they removed his channel. And so I've been able to, to build up a, a pretty nice reach on Twitter. And I went on, told his story and called them out. And amazingly, they, they gave him his channel back. He's a single dad. He has nobody and he lost his only son. And they confirmed it was myocarditis. And it's just, this is still happening. And it's and we need we need something. I, I just don't know what it is that can fund to counter this. But um, I don't, um, I don't know. I just, um, I will not sit by and let it happen. I have to fight back. Well, Lindsay, I think we, yeah, we we need truth, and that's exactly what you're what you're bringing. So, so many of us are are grateful for for all all your work. Please, please tell people, you know, what is the best way uh, to to follow you? So, uh, subscribing to my Substack um, is the best way to support my work. I, I really don't want to ask for charity. I am looking for something that I can have a platform where I can still do this and be able to cover my bills. I haven't found it yet, but um, I am. I'm determined to keep to keep fighting as long as I can because uh, there just isn't it doesn't make sense that there's not more people doing it. It needs to be done. There's tons of organizations that are so well funded that are that are pushing for censorship on behalf of these massive corporations. And if we don't fight back, we will not have free speech in this country. It, it, will, it won't exist. And Linda Yaccarino. In her role, she is there to cater to the advertisers because Elon needs the income to keep it going, keep it afloat. And her job is to keep them happy. And in order to keep them happy, she's going to have to suppress some, some voices and hopefully not completely censor them, but suppress those voices to appease the corporation. So our, our country is really um, in a bad place because of the stronghold uh, that corporations have. On, on people's um, ability to speak on these platforms. It's, it's, it's either the corporations or the government, and, and depending on which way you look, but it's coming from all directions. And I can't think of a, a better way to invest time or money in the fight for the ability to speak freely. We need you to keep fighting. Lindsay Jones or Texas Lindsay, thank you so much for, for joining me. Really appreciate the time you spent. Thank you so much, Liz. And that will do it for this episode of Liz Collin Reports. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.